I would like to say welcome to all of our campuses today. And those of you who are joining us online, we are in the second week of a message series called The Better Way, and I've loved this series so far. Today we're gonna have some fun together, and I wanna start my message today with a little bit of research I did this week. So often as a pastor, I'll like get in midweek and I'm kind of onto something researching, and this week I got stuck on storage units. So let me explain for just a minute before you think I'm weird. So I went down this trail, like I, I always see storage units, like every time I'm driving down the road here, and I know our, our international campuses, they shared with me there aren't a whole lot of storage units in Argentina, but there's a lot of them here. And so I started doing some research one day, and I want to share with you some of the stats that I found because they're very interesting, okay? So did you know that one fifth of every American, so one out of five Americans have a storage unit. And think about that for a second. And 14% say that they, they're planning on getting one. So that means like 34% of people have an extra place to store all their stuff aside from their house. Now, some of you are judging them, but out of a show of hands with honesty in Southern California, how many of you park your cars in the garage? Just out of curiosity, Okay, so the, the rest of us who have, you know, cars in the driveway and like $200 of stuff in the garage, park it there. So um, there's a lot of extra storage though. You, you can hear some of these stats and they'll blow you away. Um, and s some studies will show us that in addition to having extra storage, there's something called hoarding. And some of you know hoarders. And 6% of society actually has a diagnosed um, disorder called hoarding. And I want you to see some of these pictures from people who hoard. And somebody just said, that's my, that's my living room right there. And this is, I, when you look at it, you're like, okay, that, that would be a very miserable place to live. Somebody says, that's my son's room right there. That's what it looks like. And you can look at these pictures and there's a part of you that's just like, ah, oh, I would never want to have that much stuff unless you're a hoarder, and you do. Um, but for the rest of us, th there's a part of those pictures that make you feel anxious. Like, I don't want that much stuff in my house. I don't want to hoard like that. But I want to suggest to you that there are a lot of us that deal with a different kind of hoarding, that we actually live our lives in bondage to a kind of storing up in this world in a manner that is making our lives miserable and preventing us from stepping into the fullness of the kind of freedom that God wants for us to live with. And this is true whether you are a follower of Jesus or you're just here checking this whole thing out. There are so many people in our world that live in bondage to stuff, to things, when God is making an invitation to a kind of freedom that comes through a life of generosity. Now, Jesus would, would speak in Matthew 6. This is a, from the Sermon on the Mount, and we've been looking through the Sermon on the Mount throughout this series. And, Jesus would say this, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, Jesus is in the midst of this powerful sermon that he's preaching. Matthew puts it into his gospel. And the new way of life that Jesus invites us into is found in Matthew, these three chapters. He just gives us so much powerful uh, truth about the upside-down way of life that he gives us. It's called the better way. That's what we, we've been looking at. And we're going to look today at that better way that he gives to our lives around generosity. Now, when you look at the way of Jesus with generosity, it's so upside down from the way the rest of our world lives. And the key verse that we've been looking at through this series, I want to just read it before we get into our main passage for our day. Matthew 7, 13, Jesus is speaking and he says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Now, there are different ways of looking at Jesus' words. One is, this is an evaluation of our own lives, but it's also an invitation to the better way, that there is a narrow path that leads to life, and the way of generosity 
is a part of that narrow path. So today we're going to look at one story found in Luke chapter 12 where Jesus interacts with a guy who wants a family dispute settled. Sounds a little bit like Judge Judy if you've ever watched the show. And Jesus is teaching, and what we'll notice in the story is that oftentimes people would come to Jesus with a request. They would come wanting him to do something. They would come with a question, and Jesus would flip that question on its head. And he would give them actually what they needed, not what they were asking for. And sometimes it's good for us to recognize our request really d does reveal a lot about our hearts. When we come to God with a request, it shows us what's on the inside. So watch what's on the inside of this guy who comes to Jesus. It says, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Like my dad's got these ties and these t-shirts and he only gave me one and he's got seven. Tell him to divide. I thought it was funny. Nobody in this room did. But so tell him, teacher, to divide the inheritance between the two of us. And so here Jesus is teaching. It'd be like if somebody stood up in a service and just said, hey, uh, I got a family feud. Can you solve it for me? Uh, my dad just died and we need some help with the inheritance. Now Jesus is like going on with his message and he looks back at this guy who just requests a, a, an attorney to divide the inheritance and Jesus replied, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between the two of you? Like, that's not what I'm here for. I, I am not here to tell you, you, you actually can have that dresser. Like, that's, that's awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make it easier on you. Here's a dresser. He gets half of it. You get half of it. That's not why Jesus came. Jesus says, I'd, I'm not here to settle your family dispute, but actually, I'm going to teach you something that's better. I'm going to show you a different way. So watch what he says next. Jesus replied, who appointed me judge or arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. So he's going to tell a story that demonstrates truth. And listen to what he says. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. So where did the crop come from? The ground. And this man who had his ground produce a good crop is about to interpret how he sees the good crop. So I want you to notice, in fact, as we're reading through this, and I get to me, my, I, just say it with me at all of our campuses, okay? So the ground of a certain man, rich man, produced a good crop, and he thought to himself, what shall I do? Okay, feel free to say it loud, okay? What shall I do? I do. I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. There I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, self, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take it easy eat, drink, and go to Hawaii. Be merry. Enjoy your life. Uh, self, you've done well. You worked really hard. Your retirement account's been built up. Just chill and enjoy the rest of your life. But God, but God, Jesus wants us to understand God has a different way of seeing this man. And this man's looking at all of his stuff that he thinks he's produced. But God, Jesus said to him, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. And then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. Jesus is making a very definitive statement about the focus of our lives. He says, this is the reality. You will be miserable. There will be consequence if you choose to live a life where your whole ambition is to store up on planet Earth and you are not rich in your relationship with God. So I want to talk for a few moments. What does it mean to be rich toward God? Now, Jesus actually tells us what it means to be rich toward God. And we're going to unpack that because Jesus goes directly from this parable and he teaches us 
How do you have a kind of life that is not rich toward your finances, not rich toward yourself, but first, ultimately, rich toward God? And if you have your notes, I want to invite you to pull them out. The first thing that we're going to see Jesus unpack is that a life that has richness towards God does this first. It is a life where I cultivate trust in the faithful provider. Now, if you look at Jesus' teaching, he has a way that he wants us to live, one, but he also teaches a way that God wants to be seen by us as human beings. So Jesus, God the Son, is teaching about God the Father, and he's going to describe what is God the Father like? And so we can understand in our minds, whenever we sing or pray or worship, this is who we're singing and praying and worshiping to. Jesus describes him. He says, consider the Ravens, not the American football team. Consider the, the, the birds. They don't sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. If you have your notes, you can underline that phrase. God feeds them. Every bird is taken care of by the creator and the sustainer of the universe. God feeds them, Jesus says. And then he says, how much more valuable you are than the birds. God cares so much more about you than the birds that are flying back and forth in the sky. Consider next, Jesus says, how the lilies grow. They don't labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon, the great king of the Old Testament, not even Solomon in all of his splendor is, is clothed like that. If, if God, this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Jesus is describing how God wants to be seen by us and who God truly is. He is a faithful provider. He is able to provide for every need that we have the entirety of our life. And the more we understand who he is and what he's like, it changes our response to him. Because if I see God as a greedy God, it will radically impact my approach to him and my approach to life. But if I see him as he is, this abundant, generous God, it changes my life. There are three things I want you to see from this passage. First of all, the provider, God himself, is number one, he's capable. So my season of lack does not limit God. I think this is probably worth writing down. My lack is never a limitation for God. I remember seasons of our life when Stacy and I first got married uh, 21 plus years ago, and we were broke. We, we like, we'd go to the grocery store, she'd bring a calculator, we'd try to decide if we had to put the rice back, and some of you have been there before. It's a really hard place to be, but we never went without. And there were so many moments in the midst of that where our bank account balance, we're in grad school, I'm trying to get through to pursue this vision that God has put in my heart to, to start a church. And in the midst of that, there would be moments where our account balance would go down, 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 like $150. And, the, you know, there's little left in the account. And there would be a friend that would send a letter and say, hey, God, put it on my heart to give to help you in this season. And every moment along the way, what I began to see is that there are times in my life and in your life where you either feel broke or you're stretched and it feels like a season of scarcity. Did you know that God is never in a season of scarcity? There has never been a moment in all of God's eternal existence in the past where God is like, oh man, it looks like the market is falling on me. Like it's, 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 you know, it's, it's gonna be horrible Monday. Which, what was it called? That, uh, Black Monday. No, God is never concerned about the state of the planet in the sense that there, there's gonna be some crash on him. God is, he is abundant in his capacity and in his ability and it changes the way that we see life when we see God through the filter. One, he's capable. Two, he's generous. So he's a God that wants to give. He wants to be seen as a faithful provider who takes care of every need that we have. And what I've noticed is as Jesus speaks here and he says, consider that word, you might circle it. As he says the word consider, there's a kind of considering with my life 
in all of our lives, where our head can be so far down and God can be doing all kinds of things around us that we just completely miss. So our consideration is our next meal, but our, not, our consideration is not the faithfulness of God and God is doing things to show us along the way how good he is. I'll give you one little example for me this week. I love Converse shoes. They're my favorite. And we got a lot of people at Saddleback that wear Converse. And um, I had some old Converse, and I was like, I wanna get some new Converse, school starting for the kids, good time to get some new Converse. And so we went shopping this week, but the, the ones I wanted, they didn't have, so I had to order them. And so they basically said, okay, they're gonna send them to your house. And I checked online today, because I wanted to preach in my new Converse. So I checked, I checked online, and it was gonna be three days from now that the new Converse were gonna come. So I got my old Converse out, I shined them up, I cleaned them up, got them ready to, to wear today. And then about 20 minutes before I was going to come today to preach, I checked on my phone and I realized my new Converse had been delivered. So I went out front, I got my new Converse, I would like for you to see them. These are my new Converse. And I believe, you can interpret it however you want to, that it was a coincidence. I believe it was my faithful provider saying, I want you to preach in those new converse. I bless you. And when I see God that way, it, what it does is it, it just allows me to experience the joy of his provision. He's faithful. He is capable, he is generous, and he is personal. So every need that you have, he sees. Every worry on your mind, he knows. Every concern on your heart, he cares. And he's a faithful provider that when we are in relationship with him, he takes care of every need that we have. Now, he calls us to be responsible and to be faithful ourselves, but we can trust him. And he's constantly doing things that if our eyes are open, we'll see it. There, there are, friends, there are so many stories I could tell you of God's faithfulness to my life and my family. One of them was a couple years ago when Stacy and I were moving here to our new assignment to, to pastor at Saddleback. And when we moved from the San Francisco Bay Area, all the houses, one of the crazy things about the Bay Area is there's like no parking anywhere. So our house was in this neighborhood that had no parking. And one of Stacy's spiritual gifts for sure is a spiritual gift of hospitality, and one of our deep desires is to have people in our home to love and care, and it's just, it's a longing inside of us just to bless people and use our home as Grand Central Station to, to be a part of God's kingdom. And so when we're in the Bay Area, we were always limited by how much we could have people in our home because of parking. So we came up with this cool system. I had a scooter, and they would drive up to the house behind the garage. I would take the scooter, and they, or I would take their car, put it in the scooter, I would go park their car like a mile away and then drive the scooter back to the house. This is how we had people over. And it severely limited in that season how many people that we could have in our home. We we're basically stuck with, okay, well we can have three parking spots, that's what we can do. So over time as we're discerning God's call to come here to Saddleback, one of our prayers as we were moving was God, we would love it if you would give us a space where we could park a lot of cars. I, I know our neighbors won't love it, but we would love it if you could do that so that we could have people into our home. So when it was time for us to move here, we had a weekend plan. This is before we actually came down to Southern California. We had a weekend plan, and our real estate agent, Karen Quinn, who's a part of our church here, she had planned our day, and she had like four or five houses for us to see. And every house we went to, it was like, okay, there's no parking there, no parking there, no, no, that's not, no parking, no parking. Okay, I think that there's something else that God has in store. And she said, well, there's this other house that is not on the market, but I heard about it, and uh, let's go see it. So we go, and we walk up, we, dr we drive up next to the house, it's not on the market, and it's a long story. But all I'll tell you is that we had the owner, the previous owner of the house, come out as we were peeking over the fence. Like, <laughs> who are you and what are you doing? And so, long story, the house is on a street, single load street, and literally, we could park way more cars than number of people than we can fit in our house. And God, in his provision, provided 
for our family out of a desire to be hospitable and love and serve people. And now, since we've been here two years ago, we've had, we, we counted today, we've had like a thousand people come through our home in the last two years. And it was so generous of God to meet a personal desire, dream, prayer in our hearts. And, and what it does for me is it, it changes my perspective. It helps me realize he's intimately involved in my life. He's intimately involved in your life. And he wants to care for you. And the greatest way that he ultimately cares for you is through the choice that he made to come from heaven to earth to make a way so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be his children. And by faith in Jesus, who died on a cross and rose from the dead, our lives change and this generous God gives salvation to us when we receive by faith. It becomes the transformation of our lives and then over time, in that relationship, he is a faithful, heavenly father that wants to care and sometimes it's a job that he opens a door sometimes it is a house sometimes you pray for the house it's not the house sometimes it's what he does in your kids lives other times it's it's something that he does in your marriage sometimes it's a, a place of a relationship that he heals but he is just moving in your life in a way that when you see his generosity it increases your richness towards him paul would say from a prison cell with all of his needs stripped, physically, all of his stuff stripped from him, in a place of great poverty financially, he would say this, my God will supply every need of yours according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So the invitation is for us to live in a way that we experience this great joy in our relationship with God because he is a faithful provider. I love that we can cultivate this relationship with him and build our trust over time and see his faithfulness. Now, some of you, maybe when you think about that, you're like, okay, my life is really hard financially right now, and I need more than just like you to say, trust God. So this week, I had the idea, we're gonna do a seminar online uh, with some of our team, I'll be on it, this week called Better Money Habits, and I wanna invite you, uh, if you would like to just get a little bit better at how you handle money with savings and debt and all the things that often get in the way of our desire to be more generous, I'd love for you to join me this week. When you check in today, you can just say, send me the link. Uh, there is limited space on this webinar that we're going to have, so I want to encourage you to sign up quickly this weekend, and it's going to be a great opportunity for us just to, to grow in our understanding of how God wants us to handle money his way. So that's, that's point number one. Cultivate trust in the faithful provider. The second thing Jesus shows us in this passage is this. It's to prioritize your pursuits. So when you consider your life, what you give your time, your energy to, when you consider the totality of what you pursue, Jesus wants us to understand the focus of our lives. The most important thing is him and his kingdom. And listen to what he says. Do not set your heart on what you eat or drink. Don't worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things. They chase them. And your father, he knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Let the kingdom of God, Jesus is saying, be the organizing principle, the organizing objective, the center thing in your life is God and his kingdom. And there's something that shifts in your life when, when it's all about his kingdom. Now, let me explain this. Some of you are like, I don't really understand that. I don't want that. Let me give you an illustration. So this summer, we're on a trip with the family going from southeastern Michigan, where I grew up, to northern Michigan. So we flew, uh, got on an airplane, went from California, to Michigan across the United States of America and we were gonna drive that day all the way up to northern Michigan four hours, very, very long day. And in the midst of this, we're gonna get real close to a place that I used to go when I was a student, it was a restaurant, and this restaurant had a BLT, bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich with a pound of bacon on it. And it's called Tony's. And I landed and we, I had already planned my whole vacation around going to Tony's to get a BLT. And we landed, it took us an hour longer than we thought to get our rental car. 
I literally, it became the organizing principle of the entire trip. I'm looking at the clock. I am calling them at Tony's saying, we are on the way. I know you close at 7. We're going to get there at 6.59. And I'm getting my BLT, brother. Come on. And it was the focus. And what happens is when there's an organizing principle or objective, everything kind of falls in line with that. It's the focus. So the question I want to encourage you to wrestle through, what is it, what's the organizing principle and focus in your life? What is the thing that all other things submit to? And some of you, you, you have great abilities that God gave to you. There are those of you who you have the fantastic ability to build wealth or build businesses or make a difference in your career. Some of you, you're great at building homes. All of these abilities that God has given to you from career to business to the things that we can build on planet Earth, God, God gave you those abilities. But if the driving force of that ability is not what is eternal, it leaves us in a place of constantly searching and seeking and running after the thing that will not satisfy our soul. Jesus says that the world, the pagans of this world, those who don't know the love of the Father, what they do is they just run and run and run and they're, they're, they're miserable, they're dizzy. They're going from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing, hoping deep within their soul they find satisfaction. But Jesus gives us a different, better way of life. And he says you can live in such a way that your temporal time here on planet Earth is invested in something so much far greater and beyond you. It's relationship with God, one, and it's its kingdom, number two. And that leads to the final part of my message that I want to focus on, is Jesus invites us in being rich towards God to invest our lives in eternity. So you invest your life every day when you wake up. You give your time, your energy, your money to things, to jobs, to relationships, to stuff we buy. And as we pour out what Jesus is saying, Everything that you invest your life into has a direct connection to your heart. And let's go back to Luke as Jesus is speaking. He says, don't be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief can come near and no moth destroy for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is making such a profound statement about our lives, that wherever your treasure goes, your heart follows. If you've ever bought stock, you know as soon as you buy stock, you immediately start caring about a business that you never cared about before. And he's saying, if you want to shift the trajectory of your heart, you shift where you invest your life. Now this, is, this blows my mind. When I think about the practicality uh, and the power of being able with God's help to shift trajectory. Some of you maybe, you, you grew up in a family where your whole family was greedy and it was scarce and you were always pinching pennies and trying to get through and it felt like there was never enough. And in your mind you have lived in such a way where you're under this, this weight of scarcity you're under a weight of feeling like I could never be generous towards God. And Jesus is saying, actually, you, you can shift your heart by investing your life into things that are not temporal, but things that are eternal. Jesus says so clearly in Matthew 6, 20 and 21, I want you to hear again how he says it here. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So your heart follows your treasure. Your heart is constantly going wherever your treasure is. And Jesus is inviting you to worship him as the creator, as the one who's, who's worthy of your worship. And you can worship God in a lot of different ways. You can worship him with your mouth, you can worship him with your hands, you can worship him with your singing. But today what Jesus is saying through the story of this man is God wants you to worship with your wallet. 
And sometimes in a journey spiritually, people will step into relationship with God and the very last thing that they submit to God is the stewardship of the finances that are in their hands. If you've ever um, been around small kids and you are a parent, you've had this experience where you've taken your kids out to eat and you buy them food. And when you buy them food, you decide you want a little bit of their food. And one of the things I love about my three kids is that they're very grateful. All, almost all the time, they're very grateful. And then there are some moments where every once in a while, I'll test their gratitude. And usually it's when we go to a place called In-N-Out, and I don't wanna order fries, but I just want some of theirs. And I don't want the guilt of a full order, but I just want about a handful. And it's always a great experiment for me. And in that moment, so quickly, it's, it's easy to forget who's the one that bought the burger and the fries. And what I would say is so often in our understanding of God is that we so quickly can forget how generous he's been to us. Over and over and over and over again, he's been so faithful and so generous. And when I see that, when my life is lived through this lifelong journey of God's generosity to me, it increases my generosity to those around me and ultimately to invest in his kingdom, to invest in eternity. Jesus is saying you, you can live in a way that you take what's in your hands now and you store it up, not into, in, not into a retirement account here on planet Earth, but you restore it ultimately into heaven. He's not saying don't have a home. He's not saying don't invest. He's not saying don't save. He's saying that the focus of your life should be eternity. I had a conversation um, this week with some of our leaders here, and one of them who's very generous said this. He said, you know, when you think about generosity, so often the question that we ask is, how much should I give? And I thought that was such a fantastic perspective when he said, that's the wrong question. He said, the wrong question is how much I should give, and the right question is this, how much should I keep? You, you've blessed me, God, what, what, do you, what do I need to live on, and how much do you want me to keep? And the rest, is, it's all yours. It belongs to you. And there's a kind of freedom that when we're not hoarding in this world, when our life is not restricted by the things of this world, God gives so much liberty and joy and peace and he's inviting you, he's inviting me today into a greater trust relationship with himself where we experience his generosity and we give his generosity. And it's this cycle of joy that he calls us into. And what it shows us ultimately is what is the thing in my life that has my heart? What is the thing in my life that I worship? And I'll finish with this verse, Matthew 6, 24. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus is saying that one will be your God, the creator, the sustainer of the universe, or the things of this world. They cannot both be in first place. And the question I wanna encourage you to ask is which one is in first place in your life? Is God first place? Now I know, based on the quietness in the room at Lake Forest, that I am hitting on what is in our culture one of the greatest idols that we worship. It, it is a place of massive strongholds that restricts our lives from the fullness of God's blessing. And what I deeply desire, this whole sermon as your pastor is not about what I or our church wants from you. It's all about what God wants and we want for you. It's that you would experience the freedom of a lifelong pursuit of generosity, but ultimately that God would, would be first place and nothing in this world would have you. I mean, you'll have things, that's great, but those things won't have you because God is in first place. And there are some of you, I know this, some of you who've been a part of our church family for 40 years, and we are so thankful for the many thousands 
of those who've been in generations before us just giving and serving and loving and pouring out their lives, and we honor you. We honor your generosity. And I would say that there's a moment where God is inviting us in this moment, a new generation, to freshly say, it, it, it's, all, it's all yours. It, it, it belongs to you. My life, the resources that you gave to me, they're not mine that I earned with my good, uh, my good abilities and my good, my good crops are mine, my, 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 mine. It's like, no, it is from him, to him, for him, all things. He invites you into surrender, into freedom. I remember when I moved here, um, people would often say, you know, they would, they would ask a question and the first question they would ask here was different than the first question they would ask in the Bay Area. In the Bay Area, people would always ask, uh, where do you work? And when I moved here, people would always ask, where do you live? And there's something in our value system that God is inviting us into that's far greater. So I'm gonna give you another line when somebody asks you where you live. I wanna encourage you to say, I live in contentment. I live in a place called gratitude. I live in a place called provided for. I live in a place called generosity. That's where I live. And my address might change, but I have a faithful God that when I'm with nothing or my life is full of abundant and great things that he keeps giving me physically in this world, I can praise him in any place because he's a faithful provider. So I live in a place called gratitude and generosity because of his generosity towards me. I wanna invite you today to say yes to that response. Now, before we wrap up, I wanna get really practical this week. Some of you just wrestling through, what would that next step be for you? And as you scan the QR code and you check in today, you'll see there are a few next steps that you can take. One would be, I would like to join the Better Money Habits webinar this week and we'd love to have you be a part of that. Others of you, maybe you want some resources sent to your team has put together some of our old messages and resources. We've got an ebook, all of that we'd love to just send to you digitally when you check in today. And then there are some of you say, I commit to take the next step in my journey of generosity. And we wanna help you along that. Some of you, it might be to start trusting God for the first time with your giving. Others of you, it's to say, I wanna start trusting him regularly. Some of you might go to that place of a threshold trusting God with your tithe. Others of you, it's a sacrificial invitation. Wherever you are in that journey, God is inviting you along the way to take the next step. And there's some of you today that the next step he's inviting you to receive, to take, is the gift that he wants to give to you, the gift of salvation. And if you're listening to my voice and you have never opened your heart to the God that deeply loves you and made a way so that you could be forgiven from your sins, so that you could have a relationship with God, if you've never trusted in Jesus, he died on a cross, he paid the ultimate price for our sins, and when he hung there, he hung there, the Bible says he was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And what that means is he was the perfect sacrifice for our sin. None of us could live a perfect life. And before a holy and righteous God, a sacrifice was required. And God said, I'll be the sacrifice. I'll pay the price. I'll be the one who's generous so that my kids, my children can come home and have relationship with me. By faith in Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, by trusting in him with your life, you can begin relationship with God in this moment that goes through all eternity. And I wanna invite you today to say yes to this great invitation that God is giving to you. Will you close your eyes and bow your head with me at all of our campuses? And as you process what God is asking you to do today, if that's you that you say, I wanna put my trust in Jesus, today is the day that I wanna surrender to him, you can do that right now in this moment. You might pray a prayer that goes something like this, dear Jesus, I believe that you died on a cross for my sins. I believe that you rose again from the dead. I surrender my life to you today. I'm choosing to follow you the best I know how. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen.